Okay, uh, good morning. Uh, it is wonderful to be here. Uh, my name is Seth Bordenstein, uh, coming to you from Penn State University, where I direct what's called the One Health Microbiome Center. Um, this is a center composed of 560 members with 125 faculty uh, spanning 42 departments. We have very diverse interests, but ultimately we share the value and mission of studying microbes as the base of the biosphere, whether it's in humans, agriculture, or environmental ecosystems. And it's in that light that I want to talk to you today about Darwin's origin of species in light of this microbial base of the biosphere and perhaps how it's been fundamentally overlooked in studies of reproductive isolation in the origin of species from plants to animals. Um, and I hope to convince you or at least inspire you to think about that today, as well as ask questions that might allow us to explore this topic even further. So take notes if you can, raise your hand if you have a burning question, um, and I hope to have some dialogue at the end of the, end of the seminar as well. So let's start with uh, the luminary Charles Darwin. So, uh, he wrote The Origin of Species and published it in 1859. Now, many scholars of the field would claim that The Origin of Species was mistitled. It really should have been titled The Origin of Adaptations. And that's because Darwin devoted one chapter to hybridization, and that's it. He didn't propose a biological species concept. He wondered about it. Really, The Origin of Species is a textbook about how new varieties form and the fundamental role of natural selection in that process. And that species in some way are just an incidental outcome of that evolutionary process. In fact, he asked this rhetorical question in very much in this light. Why is not all nature in confusion instead of the species being as we see them well-defined? Because he viewed evolution and natural selection as a bit by bit small incremental change by change process. And therefore, we should see nature in that process in itself itself rather than having divided species boundaries. Of course, Darwin looked at the visible world. He studied animals and plants. The origin of species was a sterile book in that it lacked anything about bacteria and microbiology, which was still a relatively young field at that time. If Darwin knew about genomic variation in the microbial world, this rhetorical question would have matched it perfectly because in many cases there are very blurred lines between what's a microbial species and what's not because there's an enormous amount of variation in the microbial world. That's context, right? That's our, how our fundamental theories form with the perception of the convention of the time rather than you know, what we know now. And I find that that context will probably layer through this talk and hopefully inspire you as well. It wasn't until 1927, so we got to march forward 40, 50 years here, when a professor in Colorado, his name is Ivan Wallen, shown in this picture here, he wrote a book called Symbionticism and the Origin of Species, and he wrote this prophecy in some way, or at least prediction, that it's a rather startling proposal that bacteria, the organisms which are popularly associated with disease, may represent the fundamental causative factor in the origin of species. Now, why did Wallen say that? It's kind of ridiculous for the time. But in fact, what he discovered before Lynn Margulis, before many others worked on mitochondria, Ivan Wallen saw mitochondria in rat liver cells, noticed that they divide by binary fission, which is typical of bacteria, and claimed for the first time correctly that mitochondria are bacteria, or at least bacterial derived. Uh, he understood that since these bacteria were in plants and animal cells, that they could represent some fundamental ingredient of the origin of species that had been overlooked. Uh, this wasn't something that he worked on. He just made an observation that this could play a role in the evolutionary process that Darwin left for many to figure out. Uh, what is the basis of evolutionary biology from a genetic or maybe even a microbial perspective? So, I imagine not many of us have heard of Wallen, but why is that? What happened to Ivan Wallen's legacy? Well, he claimed that he could culture mitochondria, and at the time, to give him a fair shot, he probably thought he did, because he wasn't as worried about contamination, which is likely what he cultured when he tried to culture these mitochondria out of their rat liver cells. In addition, a fundamental change in the culture of biology occurred in 1927. This is H.J. Muller. He's a Drosophila geneticist, he uses X-ray radiation to map 
mutations that are induced by the radiation into the Drosophila genome, the Drosophila genome, the nuclear genome. And so begins this nuclear-centric foundation of biology, and we call this the modern synthesis as it accrues interest, that genetic variants, variants of phenotypes can be mapped to things in the nucleus. And so Wallen essentially gets lost to history because the modern synthesis takes off in lightning speed during the 20s and 30s. In fact, many would say that these periods were eukaryocentric, Darwin didn't think about microbes, nucleocentric because we now start mapping phenotypes to genotypes at this point, and Thomas Hunt Morgan, another famous Drosophila evolutionary geneticist, a founder of the modern synthesis, merging Mendelian genetics and uh, Darwinian evolution, wrote incorrectly in 1926 in a word, the cytoplasm can be ignored genetically, right? So let's just throw out mitochondria, let's throw out chloroplasts, let's throw out all the bacteria that live in the cytoplasm of cells. This, of course, is a, a reflection of the time, and it's really important to think about how even our luminaries made statements that were so polarizing to the future of what we'd ultimately discover, but that's what they saw at that time. And again, this is kind of the theme of where I think uh, a lot of the work that is going with respect to symbiosis and speciation. Okay, now what you're looking back here at is uh, in the 70s, Actually, I think it was a little bit before that. Um, this is Dobzhansky's group, Theodosius Dobzhansky's group. And this is Theodosius Dobzhansky here, another founder of the modern synthesis. Um, he also was a Drosophila speciation biologist. And you'll notice that there's one female in his group at this time, and that's Lee Ehrman, standing next to Dick Lewinton, if you know him as a, as a well-known population geneticist. And Lee Ehrman published a paper from Dobzhansky's group and colleagues that showed that microorganisms can cause what she labeled as infectious hybrid male sterility in a Drosophila species. So the way she was able to show that is she could see bacteria replicating in the male reproductive organs, the testes, and then she antibiotically cured it. And what do you think she found? The sterility went away, fertility came back, and she was able to prove really for one of the first times in a scientific study that bacteria can cause the types of hybrid problems that we tend to think about that accrue from a genetic perspective. That now we have reproductive isolation linked to a symbiotic microbe. And after that, uh, after Lee Ehrman's work, uh, we also have Lynn Margulis. So Lynn Margulis is most well known for the endosymbiosis theory of life. She synthesized and uh, went to work on advocating for that mitochondria are indeed uh, bacterial-derived organelles. And she gets an immense amount of credit for pushing against the grain at the time in the 70s when nobody would believe her, um, despite what Wallen found and despite what others were starting to see that mitochondria had DNA, et cetera. She was able to put it all together and put a fight up for getting us to where we are today. Because she was at that point, she also had those perceptions that Wallen did, that if mitochondria are so fundamental to the cell and have their own genome affect evolution, they could be fundamental uh, to the speciation process. Of course, uh, she was better at writing and advocating rather than doing that kind of work and really left it for future generations. So this is where I sort of see a brief history tour to where the field might be right now. And I think about this field a lot from a graduate student uh, to now over the last 25 years, that there are four motivational questions that are important to this topic, if at all maybe relevant to one of your systems as well. That is, do microbial symbionts in a plant or animal host contribute to host speciation? What types of reproductive isolation, that is the barriers that prevent interbreeding, do microbes actually cause? Do microbes slow down the speciation process? We should think about that as much as they might accelerate the host speciation process. We want to be on both sides of the intellectual equation here. And also, uh, how widespread is microbe-assisted speciation? Is Lee Ehrman's system a case study, one in a million? Or have we actually going to see something like 900,000 cases out of a million have microbes causing reproductive isolation and speciation but we just haven't looked, and that is very true. We have not studied this particular question in a wide number of systems to know the answer. 
So let's just take uh, an intellectual schema of how you can go from one species to two species from a microbial perspective, okay? So what you're looking at here is two circles. The inner circle is the holobiont structure. What I mean by that is the host and its genome and then the microbe and, and their microbiomes and their genomes. So the host and microbiome together exist in this symbiotic view of life as not just independent organisms but as an integrated consortia of eukaryotic and microbial cells, the holobiont. And of course, that holobiont then makes a phenotype, a lot of phenotypes, and that's the outer circle. So if we're going to have divergence from an ancestral state to a derived state, there'll be changes in both the host and microbiome, as well as phenotypes, and that's what's shown in yellow as the derived new species state, if you will. Let's put this in the context of reproductive isolation, because as time accrues, and so does divergence in host genomes and microbiomes, so we get more divergence over here, the prediction is that so will the characters that prevent interbreeding reproductive isolation. What does that mean? Hybrid sterility, hybrid inviability, mating isolation. So divergence in the holobiont will correlate with the accumulation of isolation. To a point that when you have complete reproductive isolation at one, you then have a new species or species status. So these two populations can't interbreed anymore. All right, let's keep thinking about this. So one way to get divergence in this whole structure is through vertical transmission of microbes that are inherited from mom to offspring or parents to offspring every generation. These are very common in the arthropod world and including in other invertebrates and vertebrates. Um, this is not a particular study case specific uh, uh, process. In addition, there could be non-vertical transmission and acquisition of new microbes because microbes can come in from the environment and now colonize the gut or the roots of its host, therefore changing the ancestral state microbiome to a now divergent new microbiome acquired from the environment. Abundance changes should also be equated in this kind of schema. That is that in the ancestral state, a microbe A might be at low abundance, but that in the derived state, that microbe A might be very high abundant. That's not trivial because abundance affects function, affects phenotype, affects disease or other traits that that microbes might influence. So you can have the same exact microbe, but be phenotypically different because their abundances are different and their impacts on the host are different which could create reproductive isolation. Um, and then finally, we need to think holistically that both natural selection and drift will influence the types and number of changes that accrue in this holobiont structure over time. So we have options to think about how these changes actually occur. Okay, so speciation in nature then, if you accept some of those arguments, is not just about the thing that we can see, but it's also about the thing that we can see that's underneath the hood, that this wasp known as Nisonia that we'll talk a lot about today is not just a wasp. It is a conglomerate of itself and its microbial cells. And if we accept that model, that speciation can accrue over time because the host and microbes are changing together, maybe some at faster paces than others, then the holobiont splits into essentially two different populations and therefore maybe two different species that can't interbreed under these imagined uh, hypotheses and processes. Okay, so this is the Nisonia wasp. I'll let you watch it for a second. It's known as a jewel wasp because it has a metallic green sheen and golden legs. You're gonna see some mating behavior between a female here and a male that's about to chase her. And that male is gonna have to get on top and do a courtship display that you'll also see. What I'd like to highlight while you're watching this video is uh, there are three species in our talk today, V, L, and G for short, okay? And they all diverged in the last million years. We call the older species pairs, Vitropenis to Geraltii, or V to G, older, one million years old. And the younger species pair, L to G, is only 400,000 years old. This is the timing of when those speciation events occurred. They coexist in North America, allopatrically and sympatrically, so there's some overlap in their geographic distributions with potential for interbreeding. There are many resources in the Nisonia system shown on the right here, including germ-free rearing. So that is going to be useful for looking at a wasp with and without its microbiome and how reproductive isolation changes in those contexts.
So this two tiny wasp is about two millimeters in size, uh, kind of like a, a, a grain rice size, a little bit smaller than a drosophila. Inside Nasonia's reproductive tissues and gametes are bacteria. And what you're looking at here is an egg in blue is stained the, the wasp DNA, and in green is the Wolbachia endosymbiont that's vertically inherited from the mother's ovaries to the developing egg each generation. So it's passed on maternally, just like mitochondria are. These Wolbachia bacteria occur in 50% of the world's arthropod species. They're very common. So Nasonia is just one of the many in, in, that, in that light. In the testes, you'll see Wolbachia stained in red and the, the wasp DNA also stained in blue. These are reproductive symbionts. They occur in the reproductive tissues and in the case of the egg, the egg receives the next pile of symbionts from the mother's deposition into the developing eggs in her ovaries. If you look at the testes of a wasp, you can actually see these pinwheel structures. And this is a transmission electron micrograph. That pinwheel is the slice right through the tail of the sperm. So you're just looking at one little slice of the sperm tail. And you can see sperm heads right here. But if you drill down even further, you can see that there are Wolbachia bacteria right inside the testes neighboring these developing sperm that are about to go fertilize you know, another, another individual. Now Wolbachia is about a micron in size, and inside Wolbachia is another symbiont, if you will. These are viruses or phages called phage woe particles that you can see as the standard icosahedral-like virus particles that occur in many other organisms. And these are predatory to some degree on Wolbachia. They lyse Wolbachia and go find new Wolbachia to occur in. Important point here from a high-level perspective is when we think about a holobiont, we're not just thinking about host and bacteria, but also the viruses and the viruses of the bacteria that are there as well. Uh, in a nice sort of matryoshka doll scenario. Now, Wolbachia uh, directly cause reproductive isolation in the system. They cause F1 hybrid death or lethality. And I'm showing you the two species pairs, their divergence times, and then in the middle are data that show how many hybrids are produced, relatively speaking. And in the older species pair, zero hybrids are produced relative to the parental crosses, which is the G species times itself and the V species times itself. In the younger species pair, it's almost the same exact story, but it's a little bit of a weaker F1 hybrid death we get a little bit of uh, viability of those hybrids. Now, why Wolbachia are linked to this trait is because if we antibiotically cure Wolbachia and redo the exact same crosses, in a Frankenstein moment, the hybrids once dead now are back to life. And that's simply because we removed the Wolbachia bacteria from the reproductive organs. And in fact, the hybrids come back to life not only in the older species pair, almost to a full degree, but in the younger species pair, the hybrids produce more offspring than the, there's more hybrid offspring than the non-hybrid parental uh, individuals. This is front and center bacterial symbionts causing a massive degree of interbreeding reduction of reproductive isolation. Now, I did my graduate career on this, so it's kind of outdated for me, but there have been many systems that have come on board over time. And what essentially is going on underneath the hood of this is a phenotype that Wolbachia cause. It's a mouthful, it's called cytoplasmic incompatibility. If you take an insect, an arthropod, and it's infected with the bacteria in green and you cross it to an uninfected female, their offspring die early in embryonic development. And we call that the CI cross for short. That's the death cross. However, the rescue cross occurs when an infected male mates with an infected female that has the same exact Wolbachia strain, then they're compatible. Now that embryonic death in the CI cross is particular to forcing an advantage for Wolbachia's own benefit, okay? Notice the number of offspring that are uninfected here versus infected. So if these are your parents and these are your offspring, twice as many offspring are now infected than uninfected with Wolbachia because mom is successfully reproducing and transmitting twice as many offspring as the uninfected mom. Wolbachia is playing essentially shenanigans with reproduction to spread itself. And that death manifests usually in early embryonic development. So right at fertilization, this is what a normal embryo would look like, a father's genome and a mother's genome. But in the CI cross, mitosis doesn't happen correctly, and the paternal genome modified, in quotes, 
begins to shred itself during the first mitotic division. This creates a situation of chromosomal aneuploidy, a defect that will be catastrophic to the rest of the development of the embryo, and then it dies. Sometimes those embryos don't have that first mitotic defect, and they develop late defects. So one and a half hours into development, this embryo should have white speckles of mitotic DNA dividing everywhere, but instead there are portions of the host uh, embryo that lack any dividing DNA, and that's going to be a defect that leads to embryonic death as well. Now, if you had an ancestral population of an arthropod that was not symbiotic with Wolbachia, we call that aposymbiotic, and then these populations split geographically, let's say, between a river or a mountain range, and different Wolbachia variants invade. Those Wolbachia variants, because they cause CI, can now deterministically favor their own spread, and they become highly prevalent and fixed in the populations. Now, two genetically identical animals or plants, let's say, and it, there's no Wolbachia in plants, but let's take this as a symbiotic basis for speciation. And then when they come back to interbreed, on secondary contact, they can't interbreed in this case because Wolbachia causes the incompatibility between those two populations. They're no longer the same Wolbachia, they're different Wolbachia, so they can't interbreed with each other because they have different, slightly different CI processes. Crucial is the genome of the animal, in this case, the arthropod, is identical, but the symbiont creates these reproductive isolation dynamics. This is uh, occurring in various ways across nature. So these are mushroom feeding Drosophila in America and Canada. There's a hybrid zone up top here where they inter interface and interbreed. There are various types of isolation that are preventing these species from fusing back together. These include CI, sexual or mating isolation, and then hybrid male sterility. So more cases finding Wolbachia as a player in the speciation process. And these are some circumstantial other cases throughout arthropods where Wolbachia is involved. This is just one piece of the puzzle, perhaps the most obvious piece of the puzzle for thinking about symbionts and speciation. Why? Because Wolbachia lives in the reproductive tissues. It affects gametic compatibility. If you're ever going to rig the deck to find a case for symbionts driving speciation, this is going to be it. And oh, when Lee Ehrman worked on hybrid marital sterility in Drosophila polystorum, the bacteria she was studying was none other than Wolbachia, where Wolbachia in hybrids between Drosophila polystorum subspecies hyperreplicate, and that causes a sterility that she could then cure. So Wolbachia is really the most obvious case for these kinds of dynamics. The Nasonia system has two layers here. One is the older species view, and one is the younger species view, where Wolbachia came in quite young to the process of genetic divergence and the amount of reproductive isolation, but once it's there, it prevented interbreeding with the other species at a com almost complete rate. Okay? In the older species pair, Wolbachia did the same thing, but if you remove Wolbachia, there's all sorts of other reproductive isolation there. And I'd like to talk to you about how we can probe those kinds of systems a little bit further and layering in other stories about the Nasonia symbiosis and speciation story. So many labs in, in this subfield of Nasonia biology have documented reproductive isolation in the F1 hybrids and in the F2 hybrids over decades. And this is really a compilation list of how the older species pair has more reproductive isolation than the younger species pair. That makes sense. Time correlates to reproductive isolation. There's a particularly strong reproductive isolation phenotype, which is F2 hybrid male lethality or inviability. And this is something that has been canonically studied in the field from a genetic perspective. What are the number and types of genes that cause this very strong hybrid male inviability on the chromosomes of Nasonia? But Nasonia is a holobiont, so it has Wolbachia, but it also has a gut bacteria and gut microbiome. And that's what it stains like. Um, just before adulthood, it, a lot of the bacteria are in the hindgut, uh, probably doing some kind of waste excretion, or they're about to be pooped out before they get a new meal as an adult. And if you breed the older species pair, as I mentioned, there's this F2 hybrid problem. That is, a lot of the hybrids, about 90% of them, will die. And so we started thinking about what if, if Wolbachia can do it, what if the gut bacteria could be involved in this trait as well? Now, this is what a wasp does, right? It lays its eggs in another host, 
This casing is from a fly, and that fly carcass is shown here in the F2 hybrid cross. And you'll notice the fly carcass is very robust here. It hasn't been consumed by its parasite wasps yet. That's because very few of those wasps developed into adulthood because those hybrids are dying relative to the two parental species that just leave a little bit of darkened material behind. These are pupae of the wasps, yellow, uh, the yellow stage. They'll darken up and then eventually become adults and crawl out of the host casing. If you look at the gut bacteria in Nisonia, they really look at a high level like many other insect bacteria, which are different from mammalian gut bacteria. In the insects, Drosophila, mosquitoes, Nisonia, gamma proteobacteria tend to rule the day. And that's what we see in the orange bars here across individuals of each of these species. In your guts, uh, in, in mice guts and other hominid guts, we tend to be dominated by Firmicutes and Bacteroidetes. Um, so a little bit of context for thinking about gut microbiome variation at a very high level. Now, getting back to that F2 hybrid lethality, this is what for decades people have studied from a genetic perspective. If you cross the older species pair, the self-crosses between the parents do quite well. But the hybrid crosses, now we're interbreeding a vitropenis or a V and a G male and female together, 80 to 90 percent of the hybrids die, and they're going to die with this very dark, hypermelanized larva. Melanized comes from melanin. Melanin gives us all sorts of pigmentation colors, but in the insect world, melanin is secreted to encapsulate pathogens. So we had always been looking at Nisonia from the perspective of, oh, the host is dying, what genes are involved? But we never quite stopped to think about, what does that melanization process actually mean? And in fact, the F2 hybrids look dark, and then the non-hybrids look their sort of normal yellowish color, that are because they're quite viable. So they don't have the melanization or immune response to track and keep hold of those pathogens. Inside these two different states of holobionts, you have a F2 hybrid with a lot of proteus bacteria, a gamma proteobacteria, and then another gamma proteobacteria in the non-hybrids called Providencia. These are actually sister genera to each other, but there is a big difference. Proteus is known to be a swarming species, and Providencia is known to be more of a swimming species. Now, swarming is group movement and behavior of the bacteria as they traverse a solid surface. And swimming is more of an individualized, I'm going to go in that direction, and the other bacteria is going to go in this direction, and we're not coordinated in any way. And what swarming tends to be associated with is pathogenesis, often in many types of human diseases and other, other organisms. So the fact that Proteus dominates the hybrids, and it's a swarming pathogenic species, becomes contextual for maybe why the melanization response is hyped up in these F2 hybrids. So how to test this? Well, we're going to need a, a germ-free rearing system to do that. We want to get rid of the microbiome and ask, do those hybrids now come back to life in our second Frankenstein moment? Now, it's a parasitoid wasp. So this means you have to rear a germ-free parasitoid in some way that it no longer sort of takes its microbes from the host anymore which occurs when those larvae are developing and they're parasitizing a fly. So we simulated growth in a transwell basket. We collected embryos of the wasps that were hybrids or non-hybrids. We sterilized the surface of the embryos, create them microbiome-free, put them in a sterile transwell plate, and underneath the filters of these transwell plates is a meniscus layer of sterilized fly host hemolymph. So they can feed and get nutrients, they're just not going to get any bacteria. And in this system, we could move from 59 eggs to 54 pupae in this pilot experiment and ultimately get viable microbiome-free Nisonia hybrids or non-hybrids. This was not simple, but uh, we had a talented grad student who took it on and was able to do it. Okay, so here is the data when we use germ-free Nisonia species that are exactly the same crosses here, but as you can see, the hybrids have come roaring back to life and now, F2 hybrid lethality and the melanization makes a lot more sense in light of this altered microbiome and the proteus bacteria blooming in those hybrids. And so then, with germ-free organisms, we can put bacteria back into the hybrids, inoculate them into the transwell plates, so those feeding larvae now take in and ingest in the bacteria. And when we do that, we could recapitulate a significant degree of the hybrid lethality that's normally there when they're interacting with the bacteria in a conventional state. So 
Bacteria toggle, the gut microbiome toggles the fate of whether these hybrids live or die. It doesn't actually take away from the fact that host genetics is very much involved, right? The host genetics is not dealing with these bacteria in the proper way. And so you get a catastrophic breakdown of the system. The host genetics is mixed up in a hybrid, the bacteria take advantage of that, and the collapse is because both have gone awry. And when you remove the microbiome, the host is somewhat stabilized then. We probably would expect the reverse, which we haven't been able to test yet, which is if you were to take out the genes that cause, the host genes and the Sony genes that cause the lethality, maybe we would t dial back on the hybrid lethality as well. It could take two to tango. So one question that we often get in this particular story is, are the proteus bacteria in the hybrids the same as those that occur in the parental species? And that's because at very low abundance, proteus occurs even in the non-hybrid parental species. And one hypothesis would be that the bacteria in the, in the parental species is then becoming pathogenic in the hybrids. So we just sequenced a whole bunch of genomes across hybrids and non-hybrids. And the short answer, each one of these circles is a different uh, proteus genome from a hybrid or non-hybrid. And they're basically all identical. And there's no particular pattern that says the hybrid proteus are different from the non-hybrid proteus. Um, so it does look like the same bacteria is benign in the parental species, but then pathogenic and uh, lethal in the hybrids. Okay, so as I mentioned, the genetic side of this is not forgot forgotten. That is that the genetics is likely playing a role in how it handles these altered microbiomes in the gut. This is uh, microarray data, and we're looking at germ-free larvae compared to uh, larvae with a microbiome, and these are the F2 hybrids that are dying. And they're either conventionally reared hybrids that have a typical microbiome state, or they're germ-free hybrids that were inoculated, so the IN for inoculated, with, with the bacteria that we could cultivate from the gut microbiome. And you'll notice there's a transcriptome difference here. The gene expression profile of immune genes is upregulated with lots of black and red tick marks relative to the more green uh, baselining in the germ-free state. The immune system is turned on. It's hyped up, as we'd expect from this melanization response. And we can just sort of compile all that data and quantitate it and show it indeed that conventional inoculated hybrids have higher immune gene expression relative to the rest of the genome, and germ-free organisms, hybrids, have very low immune gene expression relative to the rest of the genome. So this coordination between bacteria presence and immune system hyperreaction is all happening together. I'm going to connect this with one final technical experiment here, which is actually kind of beautiful because it comes from all the genetic work that have been done in this system. These are the five chromosomes of Nisonia. Four of them have molecular markers, DNA regions, that link with hybrid death, the determination of whether you live or you die. So there is a genetic basis shown on the chromosomal locations here. Now, in chromosomes one, two, and three, we tracked the regions of DNA that associate with the hybrid death. And normally, you'd expect in a Mendelian ratio that 50% of your F2 hybrids would have the allele from the V species and 50% would have the allele from the G species. But because the hybrids are dying in a conventional state, there's a bias in that Mendelian ratio. There's more V alleles on chromosome one and two and more G alleles on chromosome three. That creates that distortion between 50-50 or 0.5, between zero and one. Because not all hybrids are dying the same because their genotype determines if they are lethal. But Mendelian ratios return once we germ-free rear these organisms. That's because the genetics isn't disrupted by lethality anymore. Certain hybrids are all, aren't just living and certain hybrids are dying, they're all living. So we see Mendelian genetics restored. What that means is clearly the genetic basis of this lethality is fundamentally contingent on the microbiome basis of these hybrids as well. Okay, now a little bit of math, a little bit of visual, visualization, which is if we could take anything we can learn from these kinds of phenotypes and say, what is the acceleration pace for speciation with a microbial symbiotic basis to it? in an animal, could we start to map out expectations for that? And I'm not a mathematical biologist, but we can start to lay out scenarios of, let's say you don't have any microbiome, you're just looking at the host's three gene system. A, B, and C are different genes, and those diverge over time, 
And then when you start to interbreed these two populations that are genetically different, you can ultimately get three types of hybrid incompatibilities, death or sterility. But if you swap one of those nuclear genes with a symbiont, and you now create a model of two nuclear genes and a symbiont that are all diverging over time, the number of possible hybrid mismatches and death events is doubled. It goes from three to six. I'm not going to get into how we did all this um, conceptualization because it might take a little time to get through. But it does tell us that a symbiont and its capacities to both be vertically transmitted, horizontally transmitted, change its abundance versus not, can drive more potentially hybrid problems than just nuclear genes alone. How common is a microbiome change in hybrids? It's still very early days, but across various types of vertebrates and invertebrates, there are now case systems emerging where the microbiome or the metabolomes are altered in hybrids relative to non-hybrids. And it might be that there are systems emerging that could kind of do a germ-free rearing comparison versus a conventional microbiome-containing state in some of these systems, or perhaps you work on systems where you could think this might be a fun thing to do. That's clearly what we need more of as we move forward uh, with this field. Okay. The final thing I want to end on today is uh, how does the evolution of a host ultimately link with the changes in its microbiome? And one very simple model is it's all random. A host from nature, a host in the lab, an animal or plant, can acquire its microbes without respect to its own genetic divergence. So microbiome changes or dissimilarity have no correlation with nuclear genetic changes and phylogenetic changes. Okay. Equal opportunity for all microbes to live in a host. The second extreme comparison would be that there isn't randomness per se, but rather that there should be an expected correlation between how a host changes its genome and how the microbiome changes alongside. So the more divergence in the genome, the more divergence in the microbiome. And so this becomes an evolutionary informed model rather than a random model. And if that evolutionary informed model is evident, we can measure it through a topological test, comparing the tree of the host to the tree or dendrogram of its microbiome community relationships. And if that is evident, we call that phylosymbiosis. For phylo for being the host clade and symbiosis for being the microbiome relationships with the host evolutionary relationships. Okay. So we wanted to think about this deeply because if hosts are changing in concert with their microbiomes over evolutionary time, it could create more opportunity for these types of hybrid incompatibilities to arise. And we looked at deer mice, hominids, mosquitoes, and Nisonia, 24 species in total spanning 0 to 108 million years of evolutionary divergence. We controlled the age of each system within its own context. We controlled the diet, the nutrients were all the same uh, for each system, and we controlled the, all these individuals were female uh, rather than ch having changing sexes, which can be a microbiome variable. And ultimately, if you do these topological congruency tests across all five species where we've sampled multiple related species within these clades, um, what we show here, without getting into the details, is wherever there's a line connecting the host evolution to the microbiome dendrogram, that means that that's evidence for phylosymbosis. So in Nisonia, all four species show a phylosymbiotic relationship. In deer mice, most but not all show phylosymbiosis. Drosophila is the worst. We have two cases where there's broken phylosymbiosis, um, but the rest show it. Ultimately, if you were to look at whether there's an age restriction on phylosymbiosis, that is, you're too old or too young to show phylosymbiosis, the answer is there is none so far. We don't see it in the data. Whether you're very young or very old complex, phylosymbiosis can be evident. It doesn't mean that it's universal, but it does mean that it can be common across wide evolutionary ranges. And if we use machine learn modeling to essentially say, if this is a species microbiome, can I identify what species it belongs to without knowing the species, right? So we train the model on, here's some data linking microbiome to species, now take some new data and say, once I give you a microbiome, can you predict the species? And in the three invertebrates, the accuracy of prediction is extraordinarily high. In the mammalians, it's a little bit lower. But in all cases, it's above the null hypothesis that you couldn't predict any of these. What that essentially means is that microbiomes can inform 
what host species they belong to, that there is distinguishability in the data for algorithms to say, I know with 95% confidence you go to this particular species, and it's lower in some other cases. I think the reason that insects have a higher accuracy is because they have simpler microbiomes, so the machines are working with less complex data. Also, these are time-informed. So as I mentioned, phylosymbiosis occurs across all these species that have different evolutionary times, but that the divergence age, that is, the time at which the complex has been around for, with mosquitoes being the oldest, 100 million years, Nisonia being the youngest with a million years of evolution, the strength of how strong you can distinguish the microbiomes within those complexes is also correlated to that. So if you're young, it's harder to sort through the variation. You have more similar microbiomes. And if you're old, your, your species microbiomes are quite divergent. Right? And that makes sense uh, from everything that we just saw. So this is a topic that's really bloomed in the last 10 to 15 years. Um, a former postdoc of mine and I wrote, a, wrote an introduction to phylosymbiosis and proceedings that um, hopefully is useful to the community. And it looks like there's a rising number of cases that we summarize, whether it's in aquatic environments or terrestrial environments, lab or the field, plants or animals, where phylosymbiosis is evident. And I do want to ensure that this is not a universal trend. There are some species like birds and bats where finding phylosymbiosis is quite challenging for reasons that I think remain interesting. Why, why do certain species show phylosymbiosis and others don't? Um, but from an evolutionary informed context, if we're thinking about a general trend in the microbiome literature, phylosymbiosis is very much here to stay, and there's a lot more work we can do about its genetic and functional basis. Okay. So you could then say to uh, folks studying phylosymbiosis, well, great, that's a pattern. You know, it's nice to have that pattern, but is it consequential? Does it affect the biology of those hosts? And one way we can test that is by doing microbiome transplant experiments. So here's an imaginary scenario for the evolution of these Nisonia wasps. Over a million years, the holobiont structure changes. And at some point, you get different microbiomes that could then be transferred between the species. And the idea here is that if a microbiome evolves in alliance with its host species over time, if you put it in a different host background, you get a mismatch, and you're going to cause a harmful effect. Much like you could take a gene from a mouse and put it in a fruit fly, it might be deleterious. And here we're essentially doing that at a scale with the microbiome. Microbiome from species A shouldn't work as well in host species B if there's a functional dependency. So what do we see? Without getting into the quantitative data, these were the high-level trends, that when we move microbiomes between closely related wasp species, 20% reduction in larval size, 43% reduction in the rate to pupation, which is what you're seeing here, and that corresponds to a 40% cost in survival. They don't all make it to adulthood. Microbiome really does matter, and it's evolutionary informed from which host species you're putting it back into, whether it's the self or whether it's a related species. This indicates that there are likely selective pressures shaping the alliance of a host with its microbiome, in this case, and certainly others, but it's not well studied, so we don't know how common that, that is. This is a visual way of showing that. Uh, take a microbiome donor, move its microbiome into a recipient species, and that fitness assay will be informed by evolution. That is, if you receive your own microbiome, you're great. If you get a slightly different microbiome, you have a cost. And if you get a very divergent microbiome from a very divergent species, it's the biggest cost. Okay, so the summary of our illustrative findings then are the Nisonia is just half of the story of speciation, a biology in this system. And arguably this is the case for all hosts. It's just understudied. If we look at F1, problems of lethality, well, Wolbachia plays a dramatic role in how these hybrids live or die. And if we look at the F2 hybrid lethality, the gut bacteria plays a dramatic role and whether those hybrids live or die. So it's almost like an onion. If you keep peeling the layers back, you're going to find that this blind spot of Darwinian evolution of the uh, ideas and predictions of Wallen and Margulis really can start to be seen in current technology and current awareness of the microbiome's influence on host biology. So let's put that sort of back in a bigger context now, move out of the Nisonia system and think about why are we not seeing more data like this till, till the last few recent years. Well, one is, is that, as we mentioned, 
Animals and plants were the subject of the origin of species. So that's eukaryocentric biology, and for good reasons. Bacteria weren't well studied at the time. The tree of life, of course, from Carl Woese's perspective in the 70s, uh, really shifted everything. It flipped our sense of diversity in the biological world from it being dominated by the things we can see to the things that we can't see, that 99% of the tree of life is microbial. Okay? So we are really in a young period of time to start appreciating this. The modern synthesis created a century of nucleocentric studies and interest and themes in evolutionary biology that we look at ourselves and other organisms through our genomes first rather than our genomes and our microbiomes. Arguably, some today argue that the postmodern synthesis phase is happening for many scholars right underneath our noses, that holism and reductionism can coexist here as we appreciate the microbiome as a fundamental component of host biology and the processes that generate life's diversity. And I really do think that there's something important happening in the life sciences right now with regards to that, that we can study whole systems because of the technologies we have, because of the tools of germ pre-rearing, but we can also complement that with reductionist studies linking genetic effects into the whole system and putting it all back together. And so maybe over the next 80 years, to complete a century of focus in this area, we'll have a better sense of the fundamental factors driving the origin of species. And maybe Wallen was right all along. Maybe he wasn't. Right now, we can't say that he was, that bacteria are the fundamental factor in the origin of species. But we can see reasons to keep pursuing this going forward. So from Darwin to some of our pioneers in the symbiosis and speciation field, Wallen, uh, Lee Ehrman, Lynn Margulis, we are definitely in an interesting time. Um, and uh, finding all sorts of ways to study this a little bit further. This is the team that helped us uh, produce a lot of this work, and in yellow are uh, some of the chief investigators behind it. Rob Brucker was a graduate student, now owns a, uh, now owns a company called Dermbiant that works on human skin microbiomes. Teddy Von Opstel was important to the phylosymbiosis work. Um, he's now uh, an advisor for science and technology policy. And Andrew Brooks is also in the phylosymbiosis game. Uh, he's now a postdoc at Stanford uh, working on human microbiomes. With that, I will be happy to entertain any discussion and questions and thoughts. I thank you for listening. I hope you guys learned something. Appreciate it. <clears throat>